Palm Sunday story comes from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Jesus' disciples brought him a colt, and after throwing their cloaks upon it, they sat him upon the colt. And as Jesus rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks in the road. And as he was approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees said to Jesus, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And as he came near to the city, he wept, saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, would that you knew the things that make for peace. And then continuing our series called God's Odd Benedictions, the seventh beatitude, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was a kid, my mom's best friend was named Irene. It's a bit of a retro name. You don't meet too many young Irenes anymore. The name peaked in 1920, and it's been downhill ever since. But it is still one of the greatest names in the language because Irene is an anglicized version of the Greek word Irene, which means peace. The Greek goddess Irene and the Roman goddess Pax are always depicted in art and sculpture as female figures. She holds a scepter in one hand because peace rules. And she holds a cornucopia in the other because you can only have plenty when there is peace. And she clutches a baby in her arm because when there is peace, all creation is fertile. The soil is fecund, babies are born, the crops grow tall, the rains fall plentifully, and the animals give birth to their young. And we know this existentially right now when we see the ruins in Ukraine and Gaza. After Jesus entered the holy city on that donkey, that first Palm Sunday, he wept and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, would that you knew the things that make for peace. If Jesus were to visit Jerusalem or Rapha today, he would weep bitterly. Blessed are the peacemakers, says Jesus, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, he says, not the peace lovers. It's not enough to love peace or to want peace. You have to make peace. You have to work for it. Some people only love peace because they hate conflict so much. But conflict avoidance is not peacemaking. In the 1990s, I served the Westminster Presbyterian Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And at the same time in the 90s, my very good friend was teaching American fiction at my alma mater, Calvin College, also in Grand Rapids. He invited me to give a guest lecture. He, I was so honored by this. I think I was supposed to talk about a book or something, The Great Gatsby, or whatever. And I couldn't figure out why he invited me to speak at Calvin College, because in the 90s, 30 years ago, Westminster Presbyterian Church was legendary for its ministry to gay people. We wanted to make sure that everybody experienced grace and welcome at Westminster. On Sunday morning, we'd have 700 people worshiping God with us, and about 75 at least would be gay because they felt safe there. They felt welcome there. And that's a problem because in the dictionary under evangelical, there's a picture of Calvin College. So I can't figure out why my friend invited me to speak there. So I'm teaching this class. It's meeting in a conference center with living room seating. There are coaches and chairs. 30 students there, most of the students are sitting on the floor. And the consensus was that 30 people in that room thought I was wicked, and one person in that room, me, thought I was doing Jesus' work. So after my lecture, there's a Q&A uh, session. And right next to me, sitting on the floor, three feet away, is a Kelvin College English professor. And as the conversation went, guess what we were talking about instantly? I didn't bring it up. The students brought it up. Conversation got a little heated, and the Calvin College professor started inching away from me. 
slowly and inconspicuously. And after about five minutes of this, he had crawled clear out of the room. Now, I didn't take it personally. He liked me. He disagreed with me, but he liked me. I don't even think he knew what he was doing. His body could not physically stand the conflict, so he had to leave against his will. But conflict avoidance is not peacemaking. This is one of the least odd of God's odd benedictions. Of course, Jesus would love peace. We get this. We understand it. It's almost obvious and self-evident, almost banal. Who doesn't like peacemakers? Until you stop to think about it for a moment and realized in this angry, fractured world how many people spend all their time and all their energy and all their social media presence not building bridges but tearing them down with ugly nicknames and making fun of people's flaws and disabilities and exaggerating the differences between us and using dog whistle words from history's worst felons. That's not peacemaking, that's the opposite. The NCAA tournaments have commenced. Greatest season of the sports year. University of Connecticut versus Northwestern tonight at 6.30. Forgive me for wearing blue. Caitlin Clark is center stage. Caitlin Clark is not only good for basketball, she's good for the economy. Wherever she goes, she sells out arenas. Not just in Iowa City, but in Madison, Ann Arbor, and State College as well. Wherever she goes, she boosts the economy single-handedly. Not just with basketball tickets, but with parking spaces and hotel rooms and airline fares and bars and restaurants and nachos and popcorn in the stands. Wherever she goes, the economy goes up. So they start talking about Clarkonomics. You've heard of Swifties, right? Fans of Taylor Swift. Now there are Clarkies. But Caitlin Clark is not just a playa. She's a peacemaker. Do you remember the NCAA Women's Championship last year, 2023, University of Iowa versus Louisiana State University? Told you a couple of weeks ago how competitive Caitlin Clark is, right? When she scores on you, she's in your face. She flaunts, she swaggers, she gloats. She is not shy. She gets right in your face. Well, in the waning minutes of last year's Women's NCAA Championship game, LSU is going to beat the University of Iowa and Caitlin Clark. That's clear. And in the waning minutes, this stunning African-American woman with three-inch lashes and dramatic makeup gets right in Caitlin's face. She gives Caitlin a taste of her own medicine, points at her finger. My turn for a ring, she says. Turned everything around on Caitlin Clark. And America was aghast. We couldn't believe how unsportsmanlike this Angel Reese was acting. Now, Caitlin Clark is white, of course, and Angel Reese is black. Somehow, this kind of behavior looks different on a black woman to many Americans. One sportscaster called Angel Reese a freaking idiot. A 19 year old girl, freaking idiot. And so, of course, they asked Caitlin Clark, were you insulted by Angel Reese? Did she offend you? But Caitlin Clark is having none of this false rivalry. She says, I admire Angel Reese. She's a great basketball player. She's going to go everywhere with her basketball. She would not be baited into this false rivalry, wouldn't profit from the noise and drama around her op opponent. Caitlin Clark knows how important she is to the game of basketball. And she knows how important Angel Reese is to the game of basketball. That's peacemaking. Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg are the two most patriotic Americans I can think of. First, there was Saving Private Ryan about D-Day in 1998. Then there was Band of Brothers in 2001 about the Battle of the Bulge. And then there was the Pacific in 2010 about Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal and Okinawa. Now there is Masters of the Air about the B-17 Flying Fortress pilots we sent over Germany to dispatch ball bearing factories and submarine pens. 
This television series follows the exploits of the 100th bombing group in the 8th Army Air Force in 1943, especially Majors John Egan and Gail Clevin, two raffish, flashy pilots from the group. The 100th bombing group suffered so many casualties and lost so many B-17s that they became known as the Bloody 100th. On one mission over the Ruhr Valley, they sent 13 planes out and one returned. B-17 crew consists of 10 men, 120 airmen killed or captured. So this television series is not for the faint of heart. It's filled with death and destruction in the air and on the ground. We sent these boys to kill. These farmers, these lawyers, these school teachers. We sent them out for death and destruction. But do you know what the bloody 100th last mission was? Beginning on May 1, 1945, the day after Hitler died, and continuing for a week until May 8, the day Germany surrendered, the Bloody 100th and their comrades dropped 11,000 tons of food into the Netherlands, which was starving and still occupied by the Nazis. These rations did not have parachutes, and so the B-17s flew at an altitude of 400 feet. The Dutch spelled out many thanks on the ground in tulips. And in the series, a little Dutch girl reaches into one of these packages and she pulls out a beautiful Florida orange. First orange she's seen in five years. And if your breath doesn't catch when you see that, you're not paying attention. Because that orange is not just an orange. That orange is a symbol. That orange stands for America. First, you face down the titanic malice of Nazism with lethal force. You don't want to do it. All you want is peace. But democracy is precious and must be defended. First, you face down vile, unthinkable hatred. And once you've done that, you start over. You turn your attention to life. You make peace. That orange stands for American foreign policy after World War II. $200 billion in today's valuations. $200 billion spent to rebuild Europe and Japan. $200 billion to turn our most loathed enemies into our most important friends. That's peacemaking. That's what that orange means. Now, most of us aren't heroes like that. We paint on a smaller canvas. We won't hurl our body into harm's way like Bucky Clevin or invent the Marshall Plan. But we can be peacemakers in our own small corner of the world. You could start with your neighbor who always manages to vote for the wrong guy. <laughs> 